Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. How are Seattle City Council members preparing for a budget session where they're facing a $260 million deficit? And why are advocates concerned about a new proposal from the council over funding for mental health in Seattle schools? I'm talking with the council's budget chair, council member Dan Strauss, about these issues and the questions you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. If we get a revenue forecast in October that is in the negative direction, we've got a big problem. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. Well, welcome to Council Edition. I'm Brian Callanan, and I'm with Dan Strauss, who represents District 6 on the council, which includes parts of Fremont, Green Lake, Finney Ridge, Loyal Heights, Ballard, West Magnolia. I hope I got them all there. Uh, he's also the chair of the council's budget committee, so he's been a little bit busy. Council Member Strauss, thanks a lot for taking the time. Thanks for having me. All right, let's jump into it here. I wanted to start with a look at the supplemental budget process here in the middle of August, which is something the council does to provide corrections to the already adopted budget. Specifically, there was a concern over funding for mental health at Seattle Public Schools, especially in light of the gun violence we've seen recently at Garfield High and other locations. Last year, the council approved a plan to provide $20 million for mental health services and gun violence prevention programs at our schools. That amount was set to $10 million in the mayor's supplemental budget proposal back in July, and many public commenters called on the council to add back that funding. This money belongs to our youth. The previous council made a commitment in response to the rising gun violence to do something. Many of you campaigned on this promise to do something and to advocate for our youth. And honestly, we should not be here again asking for this money. And Councilmember Strauss, you added an amendment to this legislation to bring the amount back to just over $12 million, but not up to the original $20 million. And I know we're going to get into the weeds pretty quickly here, but I did want to talk about how the average person sees this. They're seeing $20 million promised from last year, and now they're not getting that full amount. Why not? How do you explain this? We're halfway through the year, and I think what's most important is that the students need to know we want to get them mental health services as fast as possible. So when the when Councilmember Swan's amendment passed last year, there was no plan attached to it. And no spending plan, yeah. It was just a the revenue in the door, but there was no implementation plan. And so we got to work real quickly. The mayor's office got to work real quickly. Without a usually money is a plan is created and then money is allocated so that on January 1st that money can be out the door okay because the money came first the cart became came before the mm -hmm. the horse came before the okay cart. okay yeah yeah uh, uh, the cart before the horse yeah wherever you where do you want we, go. we got Sorry. carts and horses yeah. I got gotcha. you uh, yeah because we did the opposite in this situation we had to quickly create a plan and get that money to get that money out the door okay so this Which, is the amount okay keep going please so if we had waited until the fall budget process, we could have looked at a full school year. Even just my amendment, that, that additional 2.25, I don't know that we can spend $12.25 million mm -hmm. in the next four months. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that we need to come back to this conversation in the fall budget process starting next month because kids need the mental health services that they deserve in their schools and we need to support them in that. Yeah. And so what we're looking at right now is ten, well, twelve point two five million dollars mm -hmm. to be spent in the next four months. Okay. And then we're gonna come back during our fall budget process and look at how are we moving forward. I okay. can tell you there's a shortage of counselors um, the school district has a, I won't get into the politics. No, the I, under, I understand district, what you're saying, but these are two if, different jurisdictions. If I had yeah. a magic wand and could spend that $20 million today, right. I absolutely would. I think that there's even a little bit of, you heard me say yesterday, mm -hmm. we're going to stretch right now. We're going to stretch to that 12.25 because I think that there is some concern that it can't even all be spent. Yeah. Right? Right. And if we, if the mayor's office had waited until next month, to figure out to allocate the spending plan for a full year, right. we could be talking about $20 million in a more comprehensive manner. Okay. We're halfway through the year. We're talking about over half the amount of money. Okay. I think what the public needs to know and what students most specifically need mm -hmm. to know is even though it's not the city of Seattle's 
primary job, that's the states, mm -hmm. even though it's with not education, a, yeah, with right. Education, even though we're not the school district, we want them to get the support that they need. Okay. We want our kids to be safe. We want gun violence to be reduced around our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. And that's the commitment we're going to keep. Let me follow up on this because I wanted to point out that student mental health funding is just one part of the supplemental budget. That's we're right. talking about the council adding $800,000 to the Seattle Police Department's marketing budget, expanding care, Seattle's 911 alternative response, there are other programs mm -hmm. too. I heard you also say in the dais that this supplemental budget process was a dry run for the usual fall budget process. And I wanted to figure out if it was a good dry run because if work on the supplemental budget is involved, this level of concern, packed house of commenters in council chambers, I'm wondering what you're anticipating for the fall. What I mean by it was a dry run is that's been the experience every year we've passed a budget in person. Mm, yeah. I think even for the last four years, we haven't done as much in-person work. That's true, okay. And what I've really appreciated about this year is that we're doing work in person, we're doing work on the dais. It feels like it did in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so in, during the last four years, council members could log in via Zoom yep. for our nine-hour meetings. Right, they were, they were longer, that's for sure. Which is different situation than sitting on the dais for nine hours. Yeah. And then in addition to that, we've got six new freshman council members yeah. that have not been through a, a budget process. Yeah. And I don't know that they're all, uh, I don't know that they all know how much time we're going to be spending on the dais together I, I for am, the next three months. I'm, I'm going to follow up on that <laughs> in a little bit and talk about the budget priorities for this fall. But I did want to talk about another big issue the council has been wrestling with here in August, a bill from council member Moore regarding soap, stay out of areas of prostitution and soda, stay out of drug areas. So city attorney Ann Davison has really been advocating for this, for soda, creating areas in downtown Seattle and the CID where any drug crime could lead to gross misdemeanor charges up to 364 days in jail. $5,000 fine. Then there's the SOAP, an area on North Aurora from 85th to 145th. The council is considering a law loitering for the purposes of prostitution as another gross misdemeanor that would apply in this part of the city. I saw that SOAP drew the bulk of the speakers in public comment. Some believe this will be a good tool to clean up crime. Others say this will put more sex workers in jail and won't provide any meaningful help for them. Too many bullets have come within inches of hitting neighbors and too many bullets have hit trafficked girls. Anyone living in our neighborhood can see things can't continue this way. The SOAP legislation as written unintentionally targets vulnerable women in the sex trade who are often victims of trafficking. It does not propose additional funding or resources or have a provision for women who may live in a SOAP zone. Council Member Strauss, I just wanted to get your take on soda and SOAP. What impact do you think they'll have if the council passes these? Thanks, Brian. I'm still examining both bills. I yeah. don't sit on the committee, and I was listening in yesterday to yeah. public comment and the committee's, committee's work. What I can tell you at a high level, or you know, around Aurora especially, because in North Seattle, my district, and you, know, you mentioned my district. I'm elected by the people of Magnolia, Fremont, Finney, Green Lake, Greenwood, Crown Hill, Loyal Heights. I think Ballard, you got them all. Many, yeah. Many, many yeah. Other micro right, right, right. But I represent the entire city of Seattle. And I think that it's important for all of us to know that even though we're elected by a district, it's our job to represent our entire city. Right. And so when I'm looking at what is happening on Aurora, we know two things, that things have gotten worse in the last few years and that we need to address them. And for me personally, I don't believe that we should be criminalizing f women and, and others who are, at the end of the day, oftentimes victims themselves. Right. Right. And I don't want, or e even if they're choosing that line of work, sure. I, putting the criminality on them is, is the unintended consequence right. from our need, our absolute need, to disrupt the criminal activity and the criminal cycles of both human trafficking and the other criminal activity that we're seeing on North Aurora. Yep. The gun violence, all, all of that. And those two things can be true simultaneously. And that's what I'm going to be looking for as I continue going through this, examining this bill. Yeah. When I look at soda mm -hmm. downtown, there are two things to be true here as well, yeah. which is fentanyl is like no other drug we've seen. Mm -hmm. In my time in office, we went from having very few overdoses or poisonings that yes, we call right, poisonings right. at this point, and a lot of heroin use. And that has 
We don't see as many needles around the city. There's less heroin use. And there's a lot more fentanyl use. Yeah. And that has increased the amount of deaths. Yes, overdose Whether by deaths. over yeah. deaths or overdose or by poisonings. Okay. And it is very, what the auditor has shown us is that those areas are pretty focused in a few places in our city. Okay. Um, there's a few downtown, 12th and Jackson, around Harborview. But, you know, you look at Harborview and that's a health institution. Right, should right? be. And right. so that's how I'm also viewing, uh, I'm examining this bill is to understand what has changed in the last four years. You know, we don't want to just push this problem to another place. Right. And we need to address this fentanyl epidemic like the problem it is. Yeah, and, and I can I can see you wrestling with this in, in your mind there. And I, I just wanted to talk about this in a, in a bigger picture here because bringing back soda and soap zones is a reversal of what the former council did. You were part of a council that repealed these laws unanimously four years ago. And one of the concerns then, and I think you've brought it up here now, is you don't want to make sure, you don't want to make sure you're not harming the people who are the most vulnerable here. I, I guess I'm seeing a different approach from this uh, council, this newer council, where they are trying to use more law enforcement potentially to reach out to people, potentially to get them into treatment or what have you, but definitely using law enforcement first. And I, I wanted to talk to you about that because it feels like a different approach from councils in the past. And what, what are your thoughts about that? With nine separately elected officials being yep. reelected every four years on yeah. two different cycles, right. you get a lot of different opinions with each with each individual, okay. right? And no matter what, but I, I do think that even the last council, mm -hmm. and I'm speaking with broad strokes here, yeah. well, actually, I'll, I'll bring it back to me. Okay, do it. I'm just gonna speak for myself. Fair. Which is the, the same for me is true today as it was before. Okay. I don't want to see people human trafficked. I don't want to see gunshots in our street. I don't want to see this criminal activity that is making people feel unsafe in the neighborhoods that they live. Right. And I don't want to criminalize women and others who are doing this work. Yeah. Okay. This is going to be the, the wrestling match, I know, over the yeah. next couple of months. Here, and I so. think that there's a, a pathway forward. Okay. You know, and that's why I'm taking a lot of work. Uh, I'm taking, a, taking time to read mm -hmm. the bill. Um, and I think it might take a little bit longer than yeah. other council members might think, you know, maybe we get it done before budget. I, I'm, again, not Fair. on the committee. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not working on the bill, you know, right. as the sponsor. So I'm um, speaking yeah. a little out of school here. No, no, no. I, I think it's important to look into these because yeah. I think you're saying a lot of things a lot of council members have said. They don't want to criminalize that activity. Council member Moore has said that as well. She really wants to go after the, the Johns out there. She wants to go after the pimps as well. And I think that's going to be the, the tough balancing act here, I guess, going forward, trying to criminalize that part, but trying to protect and help people uh, who need help, sex workers, for example. Yeah. I, I, that seems like the big balance here for you? That is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll see what happens next with that. And thank you. I want to head back to the budget, though, sure. if I could. And I know you've been watching these numbers a lot more closely than I have here, but that budget deficit number continues to creep up. The recent reports I have seen indicate the amount is maybe about $260 million here in mid-August. And I wanted to go big picture. I know people talk to you about this all the time on the street. How are we going to make up that shortfall? What do you tell people about this? I'm going to take a, a little bit of a step back. Do it. And the reason that we had a select budget series this year, so we started our select budget process in April. Right. Usually it doesn't start until September. Mm -hmm. The reason we did this was to take that 10-year and 5-year look back as to how did we get into a structural budget deficit? Because again, we pass balanced budgets every year. They're on the city budget website. Anyone can read them. It's a little dense, but it is publicly available. And so we had central staff do what is definitionally an audit. They're not third party from the city council. And so right. they did a deep review and examination of where we've come from. Okay. How did we get here? What is really clear from their analysis is that through 10 years, of high growth, so high one-time funds, mm -hmm. low inflation, we started spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that is consistent with how our city grew in a decade. I see. That the spending was in response to the growth is what you're it saying. It was paired, yeah. right? And in a lot of ways, when you're growing from a small, big city into a medium-sized big city, we're now the 17th largest city in the nation, mm -hmm. There are, grow there are adjustments that need to be made, and those come with costs. Yeah. As the entire national economy has slowed, you know, I was only four months into my first term when the pandemic started, right. which then set off a recession. Mm -hmm. During that time, we took, uh, the, we took the time to not 
cut people's jobs, to not cut people, to not cut programs. Okay. And we stabilized our city government in a way that other cities did not. What that did, using those one-time funds to stabilize our city during the recession of the pandemic, delayed those tough decisions until now, which is good because as I was just mentioning, we're now back in person mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to do this work in person. Yeah, okay. And the entire, the national economy, if everything goes right, I don't see any wood up here. Okay. Uh, uh, but, but I'm not right, gonna, right there, there you go, I do the same. Which is that if we see next month in September, the Fed lower the interest rate and mark the end of our slow recession, which then begins slow growth, mm. we will be in a new trajectory. That still leaves us hanging right now where we have, we have to address the structural yeah. budget deficit, right? right? And it's so, not just this year, it's going ahead in future it's years. It's going ahead in future yeah. years. And so how do we trim down our work while also not cutting programs that Seattleites need, while not cutting jobs that Seattleites do for other Seattleites. Mm. And this is gonna be the, the balancing act as we move forward because if the economic projections do return in the favorable, so let's play this out, though, sure. right? So let's say we, we just do an all cuts budget right now yeah. and then the economy picks up next year and we're, and we're good. Then we have to go back and rehire Mm -hmm. or reprogram everything that we just undid. Sure. What we need to do right now is be very careful to not over-index in the wrong way and make sure that we have a plan and a pathway for if and when the economy begins to re recover. Seattle's local economy has some pretty big red flags right now, though. In the last quarter, our office space uh, got wor our office space vacancy went in the wrong direction by 2%, while the national average went in the right direction by 2%. Mm -hmm. Our sales tax has been down. Uh, our real estate excise tax is only is starting to come back up, which is good. And what we see, because I sit on the Seattle City Employee Retirement Systems Board right. that does investments, I'm able to have conversations with market analysts okay. as part of my job as, as the budget chair. Got it. And what they're saying is that there is a fair amount of dry capital, potential capital to be spent it, ac across the nation uh, and potentially in Seattle. But what they're looking for is for the economy to stabilize, yeah. right? It's just, and, not, and I put it like this, in the 1980s, interest rates were higher than they are today yeah. and there was more growth. And so I think what folks are looking for right now is for the soft landing, is what we're hoping for, knocking on wood again, yeah. the soft landing next month to then begin doing slow growth. Yeah. And, and so we're gonna be watching this all along, right? There's right. another revenue forecast that comes in October. Right, just before you make that decision on the budget there. Because right. again, we have enough money in the city to make this all work, but a lot of that relies on one-time funds, you know, when when jumps, I was original for co-sponsor of Jumpstart. Yeah. And when we looked at all of those programs that we wanted to fund, that was based on the economy, continue, the sales tax, the real estate excise Being tax. Being at where they were, yeah. Where they were. And every single year since then, we've used Jumpstart to patch the holes in the budget for a one-time basis. Is that going to happen again? I don't know. Okay. You know, this is what we're looking at as we continue through the fall budget conversation. Okay. And so when I said dry run the other day, yeah. that's what got, it is. Yeah. We've got a lot of time on the dais. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of decisions to make. We have to be doing analysis of incoming information because over the course of three months, the information changes just with the revenue forecast in particular. Yeah. If the if we get a revenue forecast in October mm -hmm. that is in the negative direction, we've got a big problem. If for some reason the stock market tanks in the next month, uh, that's what Jumpstart is based off of, that's why it's doing so well. If the right. stock market tanks, we are, we are in big trouble. I can tell you that today, without Jumpstart, we would have already had to cut programs. We would have already had to lay people off. And it would have had a really negative impact for Seattleites. Okay. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that Jumpstart has been able to stabilize us, that the one-time federal funds were able to stabilize us during the pandemic. And now we've got to create a pathway 
back to stability. If we want to jump off, you know, go off of a cliff, mm. it's going to be more painful than if we step down and that we have a pathway to land softly. Okay, we will see what these deliberations are like. Looking forward to hearing more about that with you, Councilmember Strauss. I also wanted to talk about this fall season. Uh, it means it's election season too, and there's something, there is one thing that will not be on the ballot, that's I-137, a funding measure for the social housing developer that Seattleites voted to create last year. The group had the signatures to get this on the ballot in November, but the council has effectively pushed this into February of next year, which I know and you know upset a lot of supporters of the measure. Why did you vote yes on this plan to have the vote on social Social housing happen in February, not November. Yeah, I'd expected to already have a an executive session with the law department before taking that vote. I see that hadn't happened yet. Mm. Uh, I won't speak to other council members' decisions as to why or why not that you know why or why did we not have that executive session before taking that vote. But the law department had raised some legal concerns, and okay. it was prudent for me to ask them in an executive session. Uh, I'm not going to share what they said because that's, that's not what ex executive session is about. Privilege. Yeah. Um, but that was a really important step. We had that executive session. I know for me it, it answered some questions, but not all. I don't know where my other colleagues are at as far okay. as their questions that, the, that they're pondering. Um, but it was. It, I wish the lawyers were more clear with their advice. This is. I guess I just wanted to get to the bottom line of people who supported social housing. More than half of Seattleites did that last yeah. year. What do you want to tell them about where this is right now? Well, it's most likely going to be on the February ballot, Okay. Uh, from what I can tell. But again, I can't speak for my other separately elected council members or the council president okay. as to the timing of that. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more questions that I'd like to get fully answered, but I think that they are answerable uh, if the lawyers are a little bit more direct. Okay. All right. We've got some work to do there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. I wanted to talk about something else with you. The mayor recently put out a mandate saying all of his executive branch employees will be expected back to work three days a week starting in November. King County and Sound Transit will do this too, it sounds like. I've re received a few emails about this plan, and I want to throw this out there. One person writes this. How is King County going to bring all previous downtown employees back to work with its admin building mothballed? How will employees at an isolated end of downtown really affect businesses? There's one point of view. Another says, the Puget Sound Regional Council has identified work from home as an essential policy for meeting our region's greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. The mayor and the council president have established back-to-office mandates for city workers, which will have the effect of raising our emissions. Is this a choice between downtown reactivation and a stable climate? Thank you for those emails. I did want to get your take on what mandating workers back to in-person work is all about. I, I know your staff has been working more than three days a week, that's for sure. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been five days a week since the mayor reopened offices. I believe that would have been um, March of 22. Right. Um, so I find this to be in-person work. I know, but th that's very specific. My staff does work five days a week, and yep. splitting our time between our city hall office and our district six district office. Mm -hmm. And I would say what it really comes down to is the job and the circumstance. Okay. Right? Where We've had frontline workers working five days a week throughout the pandemic. Okay, that's a that, that's a that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. And does the job require in-person work or not? Is that individual caring for children, caring for their parents, caring for their own health situation? I think circumstance needs to be taken into account when we're looking at this. And then I will also say that working in person is really helpful. I can't tell you how many meetings I have not had to have because I ran into someone waiting for coffee at John's coffee cart in City Hall, mm -hmm. or running into them on the bus, or running into them walking down the hall. I ran into a couple people in the elevator yesterday, mm -hmm. and it cleared off two meetings, mm. right? Okay. And so then there's also the learning. When we're working around other people that are either at a higher or lower professional level than we are, sure. we're learning and we're teaching. That doesn't happen as easily when we're working from home. Okay. And so if, some, if one of my staff members wants to ask me just questions about how to do a job, when they see me in the office, they know when I'm free and it's easy to pop in. That mentorship is a lot easier to occur than if we're all working from home and we have to teams call one, uh, one another and then we miss the call and now we gotta call them back and suddenly we've spent five minutes just trying to call each other 
Um, the opposite is true when you accidentally bump into someone in the elevator. Okay. All right. I'm seeing where you're going there. I wanted to throw in one last email. We have just a little bit of time here. Uh, the council put in place some new measures that curb street racing, and I have actually received some emails about that. I want to throw this your way. Eric writes this. To stem street racing and increase arterial safety, why not add speed cameras like school zones have? Solutions like the speed humps added to Alki are expensive, take time to install, and just push the problem elsewhere. I want to throw this out there. I know you have a background in transportation transportation and you still serve on that committee right now. Some thoughts about more cameras out there. Is that the answer to try to curb street racing? What do you think? Uh, speed cameras are a well-loved and deeply despised <laughs> element. Both at the same time. Both yeah. at the same time. I can tell you I was doing a walk in District 6 just last week uh, about street safety and how do we both improve the vibrancy yep. of, of the street and also make it safer. And did, did a camera catch you? Were you speed walking? Or? No, 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 okay. no. But, you know, we had I had a number of different residents on the walk with me, and two of them loved the idea of speed cameras. Mm. Two of them hated it. Hmm. And so, but what I can tell you is that I started working on speed cameras a decade ago. Right. Uh, when I got to work as a legislative assistant for Senator David Frocht from Northeast Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, at that time also representing Ken Warren, um, Lake Forest Park. Right. And we, so this has been a decade in the making. And what I was also really happy to see that within the Seattle Police Officers Guild contract this year, the ability for non uh, commissioned officers are also able to review these tickets because mm -hmm. that's going to expand our ability to do it, uh, to have them. Right, effective. actually get processed and yeah. Right, and you know, I have a I have a number of different streets that have been requested already in the district, and it it, it takes bias out of the situation. Either you did or you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a resident come up to me and really upset about a, a speed ticket, you know, a mm -hmm. speeding ca a camera ticket. Yeah, and, and I said, well, it must have been in a school zone. Well, it was. Well, it could have only been during school time. Well, yeah. well it was. Yeah. And you, you were doing over the speed limit. I, well, I was. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do it again? No. Yeah. I didn't. Problem solved. Yeah. Okay. And that's important, right? I, I'll share a little bit about myself. Mm -hmm. Every year I do a kayak race from Tacoma to Port Townsend. Okay. It is 70 miles. I have 48 hours to do it. I typically finish within 24 to 29 hours. And this last year, as I was doing that race, uh, crossing between Blake Island and Bainbridge, it was about two o'clock in the morning. And guess what I heard from West Seattle? What's that? Oh, oh yeah, you bet. Yeah. All the way across the Puget Sound. Yeah. This is if I can hear cars revving their engine from across Puget Sound, how do the people in West Seattle feel? I see what you're saying. This is this is a topic I know the council is going to keep on working on over the next couple months. Uh, Councilmember Strauss, thank you so much for joining me. It's always great to be with you, Brian. All right, and we'll see you next time on Council Edition.